New Japan goes against Ring of Honor with an eye towards MSG. We'll break down two nights of Honor Rising and talk about a title change and a dream matchup in tag team wrestling. Plus, Will Ospreay has two great nights in Honor Rising, but who will he face at G1 Supercard? In WWE, the big dog returns to his yard, but what will it mean for WrestleMania? Plus, a change to Fastlane that is not going to make fans happy, but maybe better in the long run. And in NXT, DIY is back together, but how long will it last? And another tag team comes home to NXT to a raucous ovation. That and more on Two-Faced Wrestling Talk next. WrestlingInc.com brings you Two-Faced Wrestling Talk, the podcast that goes beyond WWE and goes in depth on ROH, NJPW, Impact, and more. Also featuring fun pop culture and wrestling crossovers, listener Q&As, and extended discussions about wrestling topics past, present, and future. Now, here's your host, Kelsey. Hi, and welcome to Two-Faced Wrestling Talk. I'm joined again, back on set, by my co-host, Paul. <laughs> yes, I'm done with my tour of Louisiana. I was in Lafayette uh, last week when I was with you. Since then, I've been to Alexandria covering... 14 girls basketball games in two and a half days, so voice is a little shot, but I'm ready to go. Jeez, that's a lot of games. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, and I'm doing a lot of stuff with Mardi Gras, so we're covering that at work. We cover, it's called the Rex Ball and the meeting of the courts of Rex and Comus, and my TV station I work at literally covers the whole ball, so it's like a four-hour thing on Mardi Gras night, Tuesday night, next week, and uh, it's kind of crazy at work right now preparing for that. So, but, but Mardi Gras is fun. It's not fun. It's hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's hell if you have to work it. Yes. I guess it's fun for all those tourists who come in, because yeah. otherwise you're stuck in traffic <laughs> for a flipping hour getting home from work yeah. on a usual 20-minute drive. Yes. Mardi Gras! <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> but it's okay. But we just want to apologize. Our show might be a little short because of those reasons. Paul's little voice and my crazy week. Yeah, haven't had a lot of time to delve into wrestling, but we found enough time to watch uh, two nights of Honor Rising plus Raw, SmackDown, and NXT. So we're kind of caught up, but no extended discussion this week. And so we're going to get right into it, and we'll start with the plugs. How about your plugs? <laughs> uh, I guess you could find me on Twitter at SuperKickingIt, S-U-P-E-R-K-I-C-K-I-N-G-I-T. Lots of polls going on over there. Plus, you can get new updates on my shows that will be released soon. I'm starting two new weekly live shows in the coming weeks, and one's called Kelsey Likes, all about things that I love and sharing that with you guys. The first show is about 90s Nickelodeon. I'm a big fan <laughs> of 90s Nickelodeon. Yes, and you are. The 90s in general. <laughs> <laughs> so keep tuned to my Twitter for all that info, and also our Twitter for our show at Two Facebook. Pod, T W O F A C E D P O D, to keep up with all of our wrestling stuff that we're doing. Well, you only mentioned one of the shows. What about the other show? I haven't even announced that yet, but I oh. guess I could announce it here. Well, no, we can, we can, we can wait. I guess it's kind of a cool concept. <laughs> yes. it's, it's pretty it, easy. It involves Kelsey making a decision, which she's impossible at. So yeah, I can't <laughs> choose between things, and that's literally the premise of the whole show: choosing between things I love. It'll be a crazy, messed up For, situation. Further confirming that Kelsey is a woman because she can't make a decision. Oh my god, you <laughs> cannot say that in 2019. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Any any guy that has a girlfriend can confirm it. Don't know I, where to go to dinner. Don't what to know, wear. What, what to wear. What <laughs> I, movie to go to. This is not a sexist rant. It's just a fact. Whatevs. <laughs> I do like change my outfit like 400 times. You do. <laughs> All the time. You do. But something I didn't change 400 times is the wrestling shirt I'm wearing today. Yes. And, well, you helped pick it out, but... It's a really great shirt. It's Johnny Gargano, but the logo is a spoof on the Space Jam logo. Pretty flippin' awesome, in my opinion. It's great. We didn't put it up for a poll, but the t-shirt poll, mark my words, will be back next week, and I'll be giving you guys the power to choose which wrestling shirt I'll wear. And this shirt was pulled out to be part of a poll, poll but uh, didn't end up happening. <laughs> I got too busy at work today yes. to post With it. Mardi Gras! Mardi Gras! <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> we also want to thank our friends at uh, St. Arnold Brewing for all of their support. Make sure you check out the beer garden over there. Plus, they've got some Mardi Gras activities going on uh, this weekend. So check them out. 
And also, we want to thank mybookie.ag. Make sure you use the promo code KICKIT. Yep. And so we are set to go with the show. We're going to talk about Honor Rising. It's time to give our opinions on the latest wrestling shows, news, and developments. It's time for Headlines. And we're going to do Honor Rising. And uh, when I was putting this rundown together, I initially thought I'd do night one and night two. But there was so much overlap in the storylines. We figured we'd just talk about subjects more than breaking it down by night. I like that, and, and more so than doing every match throughout the two nights, I think there are some big things we can draw from these shows that we could just talk about overall. I think one of the people who had the best performances of the two nights was Osprey. He had two great showings, basically, especially in that tag match where he was against Cobb, and they had some amazing exchanges and awesome sequences, including him lifting him up for a Stormbreaker. The strength that Osprey showed during that, and I know he had a funny thing he said after that. Yeah, some, I believe the line was, Junior, my... Yeah, my butt. Ar- arse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is appropriate. That's how he should have said it since he's British. But uh, Plus, also, they made a point of saying that his Twitter handle now doesn't it say Aerial Assassin anymore. It just says it's Assassin. So maybe a transformation a little bit from Will Ospreay. But yeah, that move on Cobb was unbelievable, the strength that he showed. Well, we've been seeing this transformation from Will for a while now. He kind of started it when he was using that elbow against Ibushi. And also how he's preaching, how he wants to make the Never Open Weight Championship more of a, a universal championship that he could defend against anybody, not just junior weights. So I think really he's trying to live that statement and really go forward with it and so i think this is a great way when you see him have performances like these it's just i think it's what he's preaching putting it into practice and i like that well now the question is who does he face next who does he face at g1 supercard he calls out jay white uh he's going to face jay white but he's also in new japan cup who the winner will face jay white wouldn't it be cool if somehow he loses against jay white coming up but then wins New Japan Cup and faces him again at G1 Supercard. Heck, I would love to see well, that. I, but I think it's going to be Ibushi who wins. Right, and I think G1 Supercard, I think they may be setting up him and Cobb. But, of course, Cobb's got to defend the uh, TV title at the next Ring of Honor pay-per-view, so you can't really build that yet. But I think what we saw there lends itself to a great matchup at G1 Supercard, Will Ospreay against Jeff Cobb. I don't care what show it is. It's a great matchup, period. I mean, they had an amazing chemistry together in the ring for a short amount of time during that match, and I can't wait to see more. It doesn't matter what show, doesn't matter where, doesn't matter when. I just, I'm eager. Another uh, match it was a six-man tag. Colt Cabana was on one side, Yano was on the other. There was the usual hijinks. Yano hits a low blow. Colt shakes hands with Yano, upsets Delirious. So the next night, Colt is tagged with Yanu, and I know this is going to come as a shock. I was actually entertained. What? Yes. You liked the Yanu match? I loved it. Well, well the back-to-back, both nights of Yanu was confused by the, the turnbuckle covers because yeah. they, they were not the Japanese long ones. They were the individual ones from Ring of Honor. But Colt brought them out and was like, oh, I got them. Yeah, he pulled here. them out from under the ring. Yeah, it was yeah. awesome. No, that made me laugh, I got to admit. Uh but they also didn't drag it out forever, so that was good, too. Yeah. The uh, main event from night one was Tanahashi Okada and Lethal versus the Kingdom. And then uh, the Kingdom the next night went against uh, Naito and Shingo. And then uh, Lethal went against TK Orion for the championship. And uh, it was a bad two days for the Kingdom. They didn't win any of those matches. But I want to talk about that main event the first night. The pure joy it seemed like okada and tanahashi and lethal had working together it seemed like they were real like having a really good time they really (laughs) just embraced the tag team and i thought they did a great job just the chemistry was there like like with Cobb and osprey against each other i feel like the chemistry was there with them tagging together on the same side another cool thing is you know i know they were tagging together But I would love to see Lethal versus Tanahashi again at some point. I think that would be awesome. And way back last year, almost a year ago, actually, at Supercard of Honor in New Orleans, we got a chance to talk to Jay Lethal because he was actually tagging with Tanahashi back then. Mm -hmm. But just him and Tanahashi, not with Okada as well. But he was saying how great it was to work with Tanahashi and how, yeah, he would would like to 
square up against him again. And they actually said that on commentary, too, that Lethal wants to face Tanahashi. And, heck, I'd sign up to see that. Yeah, maybe that'll be the main event at G1 Supercard. Uh, you know, that I think in a lot of ways, it'd be uh, two guys who are synonymous with their promotion and, and are beloved. And so I think if they were to go head-to-head at G1 Supercard, I think that'd be great. I think it would be great, but, you know, I think they could paint it like, because obviously they don't really have a beef with each other. As you said, they had so much joy from tagging together and working together on the same team. But they could paint it like it's a mutual respect thing and let's give it our all. Let's both bring everything we have to the table. Two great athletes going head-to-head. I think they could basically preach it like that, which is what Ring of Honor is always about, having great matches from great athletes, you know, just do that. And obviously they would abide by the code of honor. And I just think it could be an amazing match on the uh, flip side of this. The, the kingdom getting completely shut out in Japan. Is that bad for them? I mean, I not just from a pers- perspective and a, a perception of them that, you know, Taven's proclaiming that he's, you know, the unappointed champion basically. And yet he's part of two losses over there in new Japan kind of felt like he should have gotten over on lethal kind of like he did uh when he got the pin uh in that in uh, that house show yeah i mean but like like you just referenced i was going to bring up that point he did pin lethal cleanly not mm-hmm. that long ago if you rewind a little right. bit so to me i don't think he's hurt that much he's still a viable contender because of that pin and in ring of honor that type of thing gets you a championship match and makes you eligible to challenge for the title. So to me, no, that was good enough. I think it just makes them more heelish that they lost. And plus, you know, one of the nights wasn't even Taven who ate the pin. So, you know, I don't think it really hurts him specifically. Now, the other members in the kingdom, you could argue, yeah, they're looking, they're not looking good. (laughs) But I mean, Tanahashi has been very, very positive about TK Orion. I think he had a great showing. He was great against match. Lethal. Yeah, yeah. In his match against Lethal. I think he shined, even though he lost. And he still comes off just as a heel and super cocky. I don't think it hurts him overall. I just think he lost. And it's kind of like, it's a cool story that the Kingdom lost everything. And maybe that'll be a way for them to bounce back when they get back to the States. I don't know. They'll play it like that or Speaking something. Speaking of losing everything, Vinny Marcellia apparently lost his name when he was in Japan. Oh, if you God. guys watched the video package... I laughed so hard. I don't know why it was so funny. I don't know. The the funny Japanese pronunciations of names are so funny on some of these. And Vinny Marcellia was was called Vinny Miss Marsangaria. <laughs> well, you said it sounded like that. It sounded like it sounded like sangria. So it sounded like Marsangaria or Sangri- Marsangria or something like that. Well, however he said it, it made me laugh because it certainly wasn't Marcellia. You were, like, almost crying or something. It was ridiculous. But I do love just Japanese pronunciation no matter what. I, I think they make things so m- much more entertaining. And dramatic. And dramatic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they give it a lot more oomph and a lot more animation to their voice. And that's what I love about when they announce, you know, especially English talent when they announce that. Well, let's talk about a couple other little funny points before we get to the main two storylines that came out of that 2-9 event. Uh, <laughs> I'm just laughing about it, thinking about it. The guy in the front row with the bag over his head. Now, I feel bad if it's like some sort of medical mask that's protecting him or something. But it it reminded me of the old Saints fans, the Aints, with the paper bags over their head. Because he had this bag over his head with two little aisles, and he's taking a bunch of pictures. Yo, why do people wear bags over their head for the Saints? Tell people who don't know, because they sucked for a long time. Oh, yeah, back in the, I guess it was the 80s, and fans were supposedly embarrassed to be fans of the team, so they called themselves the Aints. Yeah, instead of the Saints. That's cool. So, yeah, that's what it reminded you of. But, you know, we don't know. I mean, I know New Japan, but I'm not versed in every single thing of history. This person could be, like, dressed up as somebody from the past. I don't know what it is. It was so ridiculous. I don't want to sound, like, ignorant, but I really don't know if it's some kind of specific thing that I'm just not knowledgeable on or if it was just somebody with a random bag on their head, (laughs) which it could be, too. So I really don't know, but it was very odd and it made me wonder what the heck is going on uh i also wrote down uh cheeseburger beloved they loved him in 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 kurgan hall they also love colt who we talked about a little while ago colt and cheeseburger got huge chance so it doesn't matter who they're in front of i think they're kind of universally loved yeah i think so and then the other thing that was a little weird for me 
is you're so used to seeing Todd Frazier. Sinclair. Yeah. Todd Frazier's a baseball player. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you're so used to seeing Todd Sinclair uh, in that tight referee shirt. And it was just weird to see him refereeing in a t-shirt. I don't know. I mean, it's it just odd. I don't same know. Same old Todd. I, yes. He was still the same official. It is weird because on the cruise, like, everyone was making such a huge deal about Todd. They were chanting for Todd. They were saying how <laughs> Todd was so good looking. Like, people were chanting for Todd. I love Todd as well. I do, too. Um, and then everyone was kind of being mean and being like, who are you to Paul Turner? Poor <laughs> Paul Turner. But um, who's the other ref, by the way, if you guys don't yeah. know who Paul Turner yeah. is. But um, I like them both. But, yes, it was unusual not seeing him in his standard stripes. Yes. All right, so that's some of the uh, little bullet points of the shows. I guess we should talk about the two main storylines, and it was the two tag teams, uh, G.O.D. and the Briscoes. Now, on night one, they paired up in an eight-man tag. And then there was some tension at the end of that. And it certainly seemed like maybe they're setting something up. I said right away, oh, my gosh, maybe G.O.D. and the Briscoes at G1 Supercard. You're like, oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, who would curse more? <laughs> That's my first reaction right away. Because both super, super vulgar and just crazy passionate tag teams. And I was like, who would be the ones who are more vulgar and more mean and more cursing? That could be a stipulation in the match, a swear jar put it <laughs> at the side of the ring I'd between like that. the two. So that bleeds into night two. G.O.D. goes against Sonata and Evil. And I really thought going into this that that maybe that they'd advance it even further and the Briscoes would cause G.O.D. the title. Of course, we know now that that didn't end up happening. But we'll start at the beginning of the match and the introduction of Tama Tonga, which you love. Yeah, he was introduced as the good bad guy, and I like that because first he was the bad boy Tomatonga, then they turned him to the good guy Tomatonga, which we know we loved. At first I didn't like, but then we started to love him. Stop we... cheating! I can't even do it. That's way too high pitch. It was like, ee! I can't do it at all. But he did that whole high pitch squeal because he was forced to hurt people. Now though, he's back to being bad in a way, but he's good bad. I like it. <laughs> Now, as the match continues, Sonata and Evil, obviously an outstanding tag team, but I have a little beef with Sonata's Paradise Lock. I like the move as it is, but to act like somebody's tied up and he's, you know, just putzing around for 20 seconds before he does something, like somebody couldn't get themselves loose, I just don't like that. I wish he would just lock in the Paradise Lock, then hit the guy right away because he's all tied up, but when he's playing to the crowd and I, I don't I don't like it it's, it's silliness well you know what that's a get off my lawn yeah lung. maybe it is maybe grumpy it is. Yeah, it, grumpy pause it's, it's just I hate stupid spots like that that are so ridiculously unrealistic like I know you've got to I suspend disbelief a little bit on stuff but it's so ridiculous that somebody would be tied up for 20 30 seconds like that I disagree with you you know I really don't think it's that hard to suspend your disbelief now Compare that to a move like, I know you don't like Joey Ryan. No. And his move where he uses, you know, to go flip people <laughs> over. So that requires an extensive suspension of and, disbelief. And I don't like that either. <laughs> I know, but I'm saying that is so far away from what this Paradise Lock entails. It's apples and oranges. I guess. I can't believe you don't like the Paradise Lock. I, I like, like it. it. I like it. I just don't like that it takes 30 seconds for something to happen after the Paradise Lock. Like, lock it in. And then hit the guy. <laughs> so can I put you in one and see if you can get out easily? I'm sure I can. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't think you're coordinated enough to even make that happen, and I'm not flexible enough to be tied up. So I think both of those things <laughs> are true, yes. So I guess you're not going to be putting you in a paradise lock. Um, <laughs> I'd just love to prove you wrong, though, because I don't think you could get out of it. So now we go to the end, and I love that super power bomb that they hit off the, the top rope. That was a, that was a great finish, and uh, G.O.D., champions once again yeah I, I could see this coming in a way because god and evil and sonata are kind of your two top tier tag teams in that division but i think that before god had won the titles back they had a more intriguing option for g1 supercard if they had gone into g1 supercard as the title holders and then lo and behold they won the title and yes now they're going to face the briscoes and i think that's a lot more entertaining and exciting than something that they would have evil and sonata do not that Evil and Sonata aren't exciting, but I just think that they faced a lot of people recently. And so I think that the 
whole matchup between the Briscoes and God would be a little more fresh and something we haven't seen a lot. And I think that's where it's at right now. So I think the decision to switch the belts from Evil and Sonata to God is a little better. Plus, I think Evil and Sonata are both in New Japan Cup, so it kind of frees them to do well in singles competition. Which uh, was also discussed during the broadcast. They asked Cole Cabana about them being tag team guys and also having singles aspirations. He said, you know, as long as they've got the belts, which kind of was a... Uh, foreshadowing. Prim- yeah, a foreshadowing. Little, yeah. As long as they've got the belts, they should concentrate on being tag team. And then if something happens, so now if something's happened, so they can work on being singles guys, yeah. I guess. Which is good because they're both two amazing singles guys. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the Briscoes did not even get involved. So then we go to the main event, Finn Juice versus the Briscoes. And really some uh, tough news coming out of this match. It was late in the match. And David Finley got hurt. Yeah, David Finley, he and Juice together had been on fire Mm -hmm. as Finn Juice. And even so, before they kind of started tagging together, David Finley has just really been increasing in popularity and just doing so well. I mean, I remember watching him when he was just still kind of wearing the black trunks, kind of not that long after he had stopped being a young lion. So to me, he's come a long way. He's really gotten to a more charismatic point in his wrestling persona. I I just like him a lot right now. And the Finn Juice thing and the Lifeblood thing, too, was really great for his character and for him as a wrestler. It kind of elevated him as a singles guy and and just as a tag guy. So he was elevated in both ways just from being a part of Lifeblood. And so to see him have his shoulder dislocated sucks. And they also announced he won't be participating in the New Japan Cup because of the shoulder. He's going to have to have surgery. Yeah, and, you know, initially we couldn't really totally tell what happened, but that once we were knew what we were looking for, you could tell as he came off the uh, top rope, he went to brace with his hand, and, you know, he's had shoulder problems in the past, and so he gets the dislocation, and it really sucks for him. It does, and I think part of the problem was he didn't even land fully, like with his feet on the on the on the canvas because his feet kind of hit the ropes Mm -hmm. actually instead of landing in the ring so yeah his pressure i guess and a lot of weight was probably put on his arms mainly his shoulder to cause that and apparently he's had shoulder issues in the past but he did tweet and say he was doing okay his shoulder was back in and um he would be out for a little while but he, he basically said he was okay so it's good to see that he seems to be in decent spirits, at least. Yeah, because, you know, like you said, this is kind of as big a push as he's gotten being a part of Lifeblood and, you know, being paired with Ju- uh, Juice Robinson obviously has been great for him as well. So they uh, they ended that match. I don't know if that was scheduled in when it ended or not. There wasn't a lot of time left in the show, so maybe not anyway. Uh, but the Briscoes retain. No interference from G.O.D., but they call out G.O.D. at the end. And it looks like we're going to get title versus title at G1 Supercard, which to me right off the bat is a headliner. It's going to be hard to hard to beat that. I am so <laughs> excited for that match. Like right now, that's something I'm looking forward to more than anything else that night. I mean, I'm sure there'll probably be a billion matches that I'll, I'll be saying, oh, that's my favorite match. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that that's the one I'm looking forward to most. Oh, I can't wait for this one. So I'll be saying that about every match, I'm sure, most of them. But this one, I mean, on paper, and just I'm such a big fan of both teams, especially Mark Briscoe and Tama Tonga. Like... I'm a huge fan of Mark Briscoe specifically because of all the funny noises. The great They had a great line in that mat- match, actually. Kevin Kelly said he didn't lose his teeth uh, from neglect. <laughs> he lost them from wrestling, you know? So everything Mark does just makes me smile and laugh. But not just being funny, beyond that, he's an incredible wrestler, and so is Jay. They just mesh so well together. They were there from the beginning of Ring of Honor, mm-hmm. as everyone likes to say so much on commentary. They were there since day one no not day one ish (laughs) day flipping one period day flipping one period no ish here okay so yeah the briscoes always been around what a great highlight match for them at g1 supercard at this huge stage in madison square garden how special will that be yeah it's gonna be awesome i mean 
we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. But it's just going to be so special for so many of these guys who have not performed in MSG. That's, yeah. That's the other part that's really special is they're going to be at one of the wrestling meccas. And a lot of them, it'll be for the first time ever. I can't believe we get to see it in person, too. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. And just to rewind, like, yeah, I talked about how much I like Mark, but also Tomatonga. So with the Briscoes bring an intensity and kind of violence. I think Tamatonga brings an intensity, but in like a cool, smooth like way. Yeah. And in fact, you know, one of the people on our channel, the editor of our website at Wrestling Inc., Nick, he interviewed Tamatonga a couple of weeks ago and asked if I had any questions I wanted to ask. And I said, Yeah, I want to ask why and how Tamatonga started doing that saunter to the ring where he's like slowly going. A lot of times people will run to the ring. With intensity, like, imagine Ultimate Warrior. You know how he used to run in and, like, shake the ropes. Lots of people coming in with a really fast-paced intensity. Tamatonga has that wrestling style, but comes in the opposite way, really slow and calculating and smooth and cool at the same time. Like, he doesn't even look like he's scared or walking slow. It's just, like, a coolness. And I asked Nick, like, you know why? He said, Tama said, every part of a wrestler is supposed to be entertaining, even his walk. Even something as small as his walk is supposed to be fun, entertaining, and nothing's supposed to be boring. Yeah, and well, he's he's entertaining in every way. And and look, we talk about him a lot. Tonga Lo is really good. I think he's really oh, underrated. Yeah. Uh, he's great on the mic when he does want to talk. Uh, so I, I love the two of them together. And uh, looking for, forward to that at G1 Supercard. Uh, before we uh, move on, uh, we did forget Osprey you wanted to talk about had a pretty good match in his first night. We, we kind of jumped ahead to the second night in that tag team, but the first night match was pretty good too. Yeah, I mean, I know you're not the hugest proponent of Castle, but I think Castle really did a great job in his singles match against Osprey. You're, re- you're literally in the ring with one of the greatest wrestlers today. And he's super high flying, and I think Castle kept up, and I think it was an awesome match, and I was really entertained. So yeah, to me, me I loved the match. It was one of my favorite of that night. Yeah, it was really good. And uh, and look, I'm not the hugest fan of Castle, but I totally respect uh, how good he looks in the ring. Uh, we talked about it in that match against Jay Lethal last year. Uh, he's really good, and you know, you also respect that you know he's been battling a lot of injuries, a lot, and been in a lot of pain. And still gets in there and performs. Oh, yeah. I definitely, definitely agree with you there. And to wrap up this whole conversation on the two nights of Honor Rising, what do you take away from this show? What's your big kind of statement after having seen these shows? What do you think? You know, part of it was a little, I don't want to say disappointment. Um, There just didn't seem to be a lot of high energy to the show for whatever reason. There were in certain parts, and obviously we we everything we hit on were the things that we really thought were good. But there were other things that you know, like the Lij versus uh, Marcelia and uh, Taven was just kind of okay, and I thought that was going to be a better match. And and there were a couple matches I felt that way about. Um, so. I guess that's one of my takeaways, but my biggest takeaway is obviously how much I'm looking forward to G.O.D. and the Briscoes. Yeah, I mean, I think, (laughs) honestly, that is my biggest takeaway, period. I want to see the smoothness and the quickness of Tomatonga versus the intensity of the Briscoes. Man, it's going to be electric. Mm. I don't even know. I know that's a corny phrase to to describe it like, but I don't know what else to say. It's going to be incredible. Well, one thing we know is our, our young fan, Mason, May not be allowed to watch that match because it is definitely going to be PG-13. There's going to be a lot of swearing. Maybe even rated R. <laughs> with all the cursing, it'll be that extreme. Well, and with all the violence as well. Uh, we will see. We're definitely looking forward to that. Now, when we come back, we turn our attention to WWE and the return of Roman Reigns and what it might mean for WrestleMania. Plus, Kofi's future after a surprise on SmackDown. St. Arnold Brewing Company, located in Houston, is Texas' oldest craft brewery. Their goal is to brew world-class beers and deliver them to their customers as fresh as possible, making them the best beers in Texas and Louisiana. Their customers are beer lovers, people that appreciate great full-flavored beers. So whether you're enjoying an art car IPA or a smooth-drinking lawnmower, look for St. Arnold beers throughout Louisiana and Texas. Our Two-Faced Wrestling Talk logo was inspired by Two-Face, the Batman animated series character, and his coin. The logo was designed by the talented and creative artist Eric Hudson. 
Eric creates wrestling themed pieces as well as other pop culture art. He is also currently working on a Roddy Piper comic book. You can follow him on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Dreaded Dinosaur. You can also support his work by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash dreaded dinosaur. Please check out his work. Welcome back to Two-Face Wrestling Talk. And as we kind of discussed a little bit in the beginning of our show, we're not doing an extended discussion. We're not doing Q&As. We're not doing Poppin' Wrestling this week. It's been an insane week for us. <laughs> Mardi Gras! <laughs> if you guys are angry, just blame Mardi Gras, please. Girls high school basketball. <laughs> oh, my God. My voice. <laughs> Didn't even sound bad. <laughs> I, I know. It's just... It sounded like Tomatonga. It's just my voice is shot after 14 games in two and a half days. You should... You should do Not the to screen. mention the eight soccer games I did last week. Yeah, but you could pop, probably in, imitate Tomatonga doing the scream. <laughs> That's what it sounded like to me. But yeah, we're really sorry, guys. We're going to be continuing our headlines discussion with some WWE talk. Then we're wrapping up the show. We really will be back to our normal selves next week, we hope. Because I'll still be recovering after Tuesday night, after Mardi Gras. Yeah, but. Right. We're going to do our best to watch a lot more, do a lot more in-depth discussion, and more analysis and more fun stuff, too. Not just analyzing the matches that happened in the shows. We're going to go more next week, more in-depth. Okay. But now, it's time to continue headlines with WWE Talk. Yep, and we're going to start with the biggest news, obviously. Uh, the return of Roman Reigns to the ring. Uh, the pop, obviously, was insane. It was, uh, it was a nice moment, for sure. But... It's opened up doors to discussions, I guess. Yeah, people on Twitter taking other sides, opposite sides, basically. Some people saying, there's no way he had leukemia. He looks too good for only having been gone for four months. And the other people were like, I can't believe you could even question it. And even Leukemia Care, this Twitter handle of actual leukemia research center i believe weighed in on it and said not everyone with leukemia has the same strand looks the same recovers the same etc 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 so they kind of crushed all people's questioning of it well i mean look i said it to you when we discussed this if it weren't true and it were a storyline wwe would get killed every sponsor would back out i mean they would be in tremendous trouble if this all turned out to be a work so yeah there's no way it's a work now have they have they brought it to the forefront and 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 certainly made roman you know you know out there with it and they, super sympathetic because yeah, of it. yeah sure sure but i mean that's natural i think anybody who's coming back you know from an injury in general is but certainly somebody that's coming back from cancer yeah look john cena's gone away and then come back from an injury, and maybe he wasn't as popular when he left, but it came back, and the crowd embraced him. Triple H, when he came back, you remember that? Yeah. After he was gone for so many months, but he came back earlier than he thought, the crowd erupted. Right. So it's natural to get that pop. And so, I, you know, I don't think that's exploitation or anything like that. I think it's a, I think it's a feel-good story, and that's all it should be. Um, the I did weigh back and forth, though. And first of all, let me go back to something you said right at the beginning. He did look like he wasn't as big as he was before. I mean, mm -hmm. he looked in good shape, but he wasn't as big as he was when he left four and a half months ago. Yeah, not as muscular. No. So right off the bat, that I to me, I think you can squelch that. To, and I'm never a person that notices that kind of thing. And I looked at him, I go, hey, he's not as big and hulking as he was, you know, four mm -hmm. months ago. But I went back and forth and I thought... Is it better to have Roman Reigns come out, you know, without his hair and a ball cap, you know, going through chemo and kind of bringing awareness to, okay, cancer sucks and this is what it is? Or is it better to show him at full strength saying, you know, as an inspiration, you can beat cancer. Look what I did. You know, I think you can look at it two ways on when maybe he should have been on TV for the first time. But the way you're talking about it makes it seem like there was a choice. Like, he didn't have a bald head. You know what I mean? He wasn't affected that way. So how could he have come out with a bald head looking affected? No, I'm, I'm speaking hypothetically. Yes. I'm just saying whatever weakened state he was in, in two, two months ago. You know, however, you know, and maybe he didn't appear any different. I don't know. I'm just saying... That's one of the things I weighed in my head is, is, is it better to show a guy fighting cancer uh, to kind of say, I'm fighting this and, you know, 
or is it better to see essentially the finished product i kicked cancer's butt kind of thing and i think i i think the way they did it is the way to do it i don't think either way is any better or worse than the other right. way i just think the situation is what it is and that's it i mean i really don't think that there's you could say oh it would have been more compelling or this or right. that it just is what it is they came out and they played it the way they did and yeah i guess I don't know. I don't. I don't know how to feel about that. Right. Yeah. I'm just saying it from a cancer awareness perspective more than anything else. I'm not talking about from a TV perspective. Well, I know what you're talking yeah. about, but the awareness is there. Yeah. No matter what. Yeah. I mean, then he was on Good Morning America the next day talking all about leukemia. Mm -hmm. So obviously, the awareness has been raised. No matter how he came out and looked, people were really excited. People were happy to see him back. And we're embracing him. And I think that would have happened no matter how he looked when he came back. Right. Well, either way, it's good to see him back. And uh, good news that he has uh, done what he said he was going to do and kicked leukemia's butt. Yeah, I'm very happy for his good health. I'm not so happy that things in WWE are looking up wrestling-wise. And I'm really liking the storylines and the entertainment. And I will say this is totally unrelated to Roman Reigns' health. Because I'm so happy he's healthy. But what... I was really liking was the the uniqueness of what was happening in WWE without him at the top, without him being injected into everything. So I hope they don't just put him right back at the top. I hope he's in some interesting feuds that are organic, nothing that is kind of forced. Although he is going to be kind of like a babyface figure, and it'd be great to pair him up with a super heel. Like, that could be some great storytelling right there. However, you know... How are they going to do that so quickly? Is he going to be a part of Mania? I mean, I don't know. Things seem to be already set in motion, and it seems kind of too soon. Right. And, you know, I mean, you the natural takeaway would be, okay, there's going to be a Shield re reunion by what happened with the three of them together again. Before Ambrose leaves. Right. Yeah. It, but Seth Rollins is already set to face Brock, so you can't really have a Shield reunion at WrestleMania unless you take Seth out of the main event for the the Universal Championship. So that is going to be interesting to see what they do, whether they they have Roman pair with Ambrose. You know, I, Well, Ambrose and him, it's it's a whole weird thing, how right. Ambrose's character is right now. It's right, well, odd. Yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, Roman could go against Baron Corbin because Corbin kind of ran his mouth about cancer a little bit and certainly reinforced his heel character. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, let's shift gears. The continuing Ronda, Charlotte, Becky saga. Uh, I'm again. I, I I feel like we are such proponents of Ronda, <laughs> but yeah. she was great on the mic again. I mean, her her line about uh, about Becky referring to her as that ginger douche in cuffs. It's great. I, I think was a great line, and, and she had some great tweets too. Like she was saying like that arm, that fake arm bar. Like you know, it looks like. I can't even say what she said because it, it's bad. But, man, I was like, man, Ronda's on fire recently. Right. And she was saying, uh, calling Becky out for taking fake uh, mug shots <laughs> in the back. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. I'm sorry. I know people love Becky, but I really loved Ronda's attacks yeah. and verbal abuse. Yeah, they, it were, was great. they were great. And then, you know, her laying the belt at Steph's feet saying, you know, whatever, just make it happen, Becky, Charlotte, and I. And so we all know it's going to happen. So... Uh, I wanted to hit on two, three really good Corey Graves lines from the week. One was about Becky, and he said that uh, if she's in prison, hopefully with good behavior, she'll get to watch WrestleMania, <laughs> implying that she won't be there because she'll still be in prison. Uh, the second one made me think of you when he said, uh, when Sasha and Bailey were in the ring and, and the line of deserving belts, and we had a, this discussion a couple weeks ago about do people deserve the belt, you know? And you said not necessarily. And he agrees with you. He says, I don't know if uh, people necessarily deserve the belt. You know, he like he was opposed to the line, that line much like you were a couple weeks ago. Well, really what makes me dislike that line came from a discussion that we had a long time ago about least favorite fan chants. Lots of people saying you deserve it was with their least favorite chant. And me too. I really don't like it either because I think it's overused. I think all wrestlers work really hard. And I have a respect for all of them, really. Every one of them. It's just a very hard job to do. It's super physical. And so to me, to say that some wrestlers deserve it over others, I don't know if that's necessarily true in the classic sense of the word. But 
you could also argue that they do deserve it. I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to say, but I kind of agree with him a little bit. I don't. I just don't like the word. Like use any other word, that'd be fine. It really comes from the chant that I just don't like. Right. Right. Well, the third line is going to relate to our next discussion. But the third line from Corey Graves was when Charlotte Flair was in the ring during SmackDown, and he alluded to the fact that Charlotte, during her entire promo, didn't even bring up what happened to her father the night before on Raw, which was a little weird. And let's get to that. The attack of Ric Flair, which you marked out on. (laughs) Oh, he's back. Batista. I was so excited. Like, this made me mark out. I wish I was watching live because I didn't. I saw a spoiler. I was like, damn it. I missed something great. Um, I'm going to call out some haters here, man. Because if we go back all the way a couple of WrestleManias ago, actually in New Orleans, right before that, yep. you know, Batista comes back. And there's this awesome documentary. I know I've talked about this on the podcast before. If you're a longtime listener, please allow me to continue on my soapbox about this. I was really bummed that the crowd didn't take to Batista. They announced him ahead of time, and it wasn't as dramatic of a fashion, like something like happened recently with the Ric Flair thing. It wasn't like that, where people were like, whoa, they had a huge reaction. It was like they already knew, yeah, they were excited, but they didn't want him to take anything away from Daniel Bryan, who was moving up the ranks, moving up the card, to basically end up being in the main event, but he almost didn't because of the whole Batista being inserted into everything. However, Batista ended up putting Brian over. So to me, I have a lot of respect for Batista. The backstage documentary that showed him coming back, he even said, wow, this crowd tonight, when he was first back, wow, this crowd tonight was really weird. Because they didn't really react to him the way he thought. And some of them were booing, even though he wasn't even playing a heelish character. Now he's true heel. And I love the way they did it. I love everything about it. I'm a huge Batista fan. He's really humble. And actually, someone tweeted out that he said that The Rock is not a good actor. Makes me love him even more. (laughs) Because I think Batista is actually the best actor to have come out of WWE. Over John Cena, over The Rock, over anybody. I feel like he can play characters, but he can also play like serious and emotional stuff too. I I really like that. So to me, he's the best actor. Well, you haven't seen Becky Lynch's performance in the Marine Six. <laughs> Sorry. I haven't either. Uh, no, I haven't. <laughs> Nor have I seen Marine Two through s- Or Mrs. Five. Performance. I'm yeah. not sure if that's The only Marine either. one I saw was the John Cena one. Again, like I said, Batiste <laughs> is one of my favorite WWE actors. Yeah, I, I look I loved uh I love that angle. Obviously they set it up in that evolution reunion. Oh yeah, they teased you know, it heavily. Yeah, you know, that there was some friction, so I thought it was well done and uh you know, it was quite quite the swerve because, you know, you thought it was going to be a normal WWE celebratory thing and and Batista attacks Ric Flair behind. I thought from uh, in the backstage, I thought it was great. I was really excited. I'm still excited. I can't believe it. We're going to see him at Mania. <laughs> I'm so flipping happy about it. If you guys want to have a beef with me about liking Batista, go right ahead and at me at Super Kicking It. That's cool. If you guys don't like Batista, we could all agree to disagree. That's fine. I mean, you guys like Becky Lynch. I like Batista. It is what it is, you know? <laughs> uh, let's switch gears and go to SmackDown. And uh, the shocker at the beginning of SmackDown, where Vince announces that Kevin Owens is replacing Kofi at Fastlane going against Daniel Bryan. And I thought Kofi did some really good uh, acting on this. Because he looked like he had tears in his eyes as he left the ring. Uh, I thought that was interesting. Maybe he would be the best actor if he left WWE (laughs) over Batista. But um, I think this was a huge blow. But I'm not really that unhappy about it because I think it could be great for Kofi in the long run if we still get Kofi facing Daniel Bryan for the title at Mania now. This is a possibility it could happen unless it's messed up by this whole Kevin Owens inclusion. No, I, you know, WWE doesn't do things right all the time or a lot of time. They have to see the the momentum that Kofi has and how into a main event against Daniel Bryan the crowd would be at MetLife Stadium as opposed to as much as we love Samoa Joe. That the pop for Kofi, the momentum he's riding right now, it just makes sense to put him in there against Daniel Bryan in the main event, especially since you've already built a little history between the two of them. So instead of wasting it at Fastlane, it makes sense 
that maybe it happens at WrestleMania. Now's the time, like you said, the momentum is there. The emotion behind Kofi and everyone wanting him to succeed is there. People are invested. This Kevin Owens blow for Fastline Lane is only making people more excited and more invested in Kofi. Like, damn it, he got wronged. And the only thing I could see messing it up, but I don't think WWE is this dumb, and I hope they're not this <laughs> well. dumb. They have been dumb in the past, so they could be this dumb. But is if, like, okay, so Kevin Owens faces Daniel Bryan but loses, and Kofi and Kevin start feuding, and they have a singles match at Mania with no belt, no nothing on the line, but it's solely based on the fact that Kevin Owens got his title shot at Fastlane and took Kofi's title shot away. To me, they could totally paint that, and that could be, like, a marquee match that WWE thinks we would all want to see. No! We want to see him win the belt. We want a huge feel-good moment. Imagine... The emotion at Mania if that happens. If Kofi is facing Brian, and the storytelling is more in that match, more developed than what's happening with Brock and Seth right now. So to me, it's a marquee match. It's a no-brainer. Well, and you could, down the line, have Kofi versus Kevin Owens at the pay-per-view after WrestleMania. Yeah, that could be like the blow-off well, after. Right. Meanwhile, I think you put Kevin Owens in this main event at Fastlane, it gives that pay-per-view a little juice because, hey, Kevin Owens is back too. So I... I think it's all stacking up to be a good decision. We'll we'll see when we walk into MetLife Stadium on uh, April 7th whether that is actually what happened. A um, couple other notes, and uh, we'll wrap up the show. We're going to talk NXT. Before we get to the actual NXT promotion, Aleister Black and Ricochet have were on both shows this week. The crowd really loves the two of them together. It's It's kind of weird that they're a tag team now, but the crowd loves it. Yeah, the crowd loves it. I'm not sure if I do because Alistair Black seems like he should be kind of like a lone guy. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, his whole persona is really like broody and, and Ricochet's so the opposite. Right. Like up and inspirational and a high-flying stylistic guy. I don't know. It's an odd pairing, but cool. I yeah. mean, and obviously they're both super over separately. So putting them together, why not? Right. But yeah, I've seen tweets. I can't say I'm the only one who said that. I've seen other tweets saying, yeah, I think that Alistair's more like a loner. This is a weird pairing. Whereas I have also seen the other side of the coin and seen people be like, I love this pairing. And in fact, you know, one of our friends, Courtney said, you know, Alistair brings the kicks and Ricochet will bring the high flying flips. Let's bring it on, <laughs> you know? Well, they uh, both look great on Raw and SmackDown. And then they were announced to be a part of this year's uh, Dusty Cup, the tag team, uh, the tournament that will lead to a uh, title opportunity. So they are in that. But the show NXT started with Gargano and Champa agreeing to come together, and they're going to be in that tournament as well. That'll be great, but you kind of are surprised that we've got some key matchups in the first round of the Dusty Classic and not, like, teams meeting up later on in the Classic. They're appearing some really hot matches right at the beginning of the Classic. Yeah, to me, like, the Undisputed Era versus Gargano and Champa, at the very least, shouldn't happen until the semifinals. It's weird that it's in the first round, so I'm surprised by that. But uh, there are cer certainly some good matchups in that, and it should be a fun tournament to uh, see who gets a chance to go against the uh, War Raiders. <laughs> uh, War at, Machine! At NXT TakeOver. You'll always be War Machine to me. <laughs> and we have another beef with a name, a changed name, that we'll talk about right now. Yeah, let's, let's talk about it. Sorry, if you were watching on YouTube, I just poked you really hard. I did, like, the finger poke of doom to you. <laughs> Surprised you didn't flop over. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, getting to the match we saw, I... Okay, so Jack, and I'm going to call him Jack because to me, just like I said with War Machine, he'll always be Jack. Plus, Dijakovic? <laughs> can you even chant that? Can you even say it three times fast? <laughs> Dijakovic, jump. See, I can't even say it once. I was about to say it, try to say it three times fast. I can't. I can say, die jack, die jack, die jack. Why didn't they just leave it that? Like, it's a lot less clunky. Yeah, I don't I don't know why they had to do that. I mean, it's weird how WWE feels like they got to change some people's names. But, like, the guy he fought. On, Keith Lee. Yeah, he, they haven't changed his name to Keith Lee Jones or something. You <laughs> yeah. Know? I mean, I don't. I or don't, just Keith. Yeah, exactly. I <laughs> So there's I don't I don't know the rationale behind that with some guys Adam Cole Matt Riddle Keith Lee they get to keep their name Dijak they felt like they had to make Dijakovic which which doesn't sound better which would have made sense if they were billing him from you know Croatia which is on his trunks he's Croatian 
but they're still billing him as from Massachusetts. So and his real <laughs> last name is Dijak. Yeah. So whatever. Uh, that's the kind of silliness that makes me worry about WWE's decision making. Sometimes is doing stuff like that. I know, me too, and especially because NXT, which is usually the smarter of the two <laughs> entities, kind of. So I, I do think that's kind of odd. But let's talk about the match itself. And yeah, it was cool. It was awesome. Some great parts. But obviously, it was just a little bit of a tease to what could come later at an unknown point. Yeah, I'm hoping it's going to be a longer match at Takeover because we the, know what they can do. These two are. So so tremendous together and for those of you who are just kind of WWE and don't know the history of them totally go back and watch a match that we've talked about on this show many many months ago almost a year ago one of the great matches in PWG that I that I have seen Yes, it was Keith Lee versus Die Jack at the time <laughs> and it was incredible it was PWG Battle of Los Angeles 2017, I believe night three. I think it is night three, and it was incredible. Like, insane stuff. Like, if their singles match, whenever it's going to happen in NXT, their longer one, if it's anything like it, it's going to blow people's socks off. Knock their socks off. Whatever the phrase is, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen. The socks will be gone. (laughs) It'll be a great match. Yeah, so, I mean, if you liked the match on NXT, which was fine, but it was only 13, 14 minutes, and there were some great spots, you owe it to yourself to... Find this this match from PWG and watch it, especially if it's announced that they're going to go against each other at TakeOver because it'll give you a good measuring stick on which match was better. And maybe we'll even rewatch it and kind of talk about it and compare it to their you know, longer singles match. I think that'll be something fun. Let's do it. <laughs> sounds, like uh, a, sounds, sounds like a plan to me. I'm making it a plan. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, excited. And finally, uh, Sasha and Bailey back on NXT, I thought... What a great moment. I mean, the crowd went insane. (laughs) I loved it. Izzy cried. But more importantly, this plays into something that you really like. And it's the idea of champions bouncing around from different shows. Not just kind of imagine them only defending on Raw or something. Right. Now they're defending between SmackDown, Raw, and NXT. That's what I wish the women's champion would do or the regular tag team champions would do. I, I, I completely agree, especially the regular tag teams. I... I, I wish that would be a, an idea that they would go to um, because this is such a great idea. Now, granted, there are not a lot of women's tag teams. Uh, you could put Io Shirai and Ky- Kyrie Sane together against those two. I think would be an amazing match. Yes. Uh, but there aren't a lot of women's tag teams. I think you could use the, uh, the other uh, four horsewomen, Shayna Baszler's cohorts. That could be a match. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I like it a lot. And, uh, I, I, I like I like the kind of nebulous booking that WWE is doing where the NXT people are kind of, are they promoted? Are they not promoted? You know, Gargano and Ciampa were up on the main show, but now they're going to be in the Dusty Classic. Aleister Black and Ricochet are going to be in the Dusty Classic. So I kind of like the little cross promotion a little bit too. However, I saw a video of Aleister Black saying goodbye. Yeah. T- on NXT. So who knows when or if that's really happening? You know, how imminent is that? I don't know. But I like the Nebulous too. And I hope, at least with Sasha and Bailey, that will, that will obviously continue. But I hope it continues with like DIY because I think they could have some great matches in NXT besides in the Dusty Classic, just in general. And they could have obviously great matches on the main roster too. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, we've seen guys go from 205 Live and wrestle in NXT and stuff. So. Yeah, why not bounce some guys around once in a while, especially, you know, in times when there's not, you know, not Royal Rumble or WrestleMania, but maybe another way to get eyeballs is is you bring some fresh matchups once in a while. Yeah, definitely. I'm all for this. I really, really (laughs) like it. Well, we'll see uh, what happens, and uh, we'll see what happens next week when we're back with you on uh, Two-Faced Wrestling Talk. Yep, hopefully it's a good show. Hopefully we're more recharged and stuff. We'll only have to see yes. and kind of wait and see I'll, situation. I'll drink, I'll drink some lemon honey tea and I'll be back in business. Psh, I got to do a lot more to recover than you, <laughs> considering I'll be up like all night on Tuesday night doing that Mardi Gras ball stuff. But I will be recharged hopefully by whenever we tape this podcast next next week and hopefully we'll be bringing you more fun information but we appreciate your time this week right now because it means a lot to us that you take the time out of your day to either listen 
to us or view us if you're watching on YouTube. Thank you so much. Don't forget to check us out at Two Face Pod, T W O F A C E D P O D, and to check me out at Super Kicking It, S U P E R K I C K I N G I T. It would mean a lot to us, and we could interact with you, and a lot of times we'll read your interactions on the show. Including next week, we'll be back to reading your. Uh... Your, your thoughts, whether it's uh, questions or an extended discussion or pop and wrestling, we haven't decided yet, but next week we're back full bore. Yep, stay <laughs> tuned, but that's all for this week. So we're going to say goodbye. That's it for us. That's the finish. Bye.